On the 31st day of October, Halloween gave to me 31 Kid Vampire Scratching, 30 Bloody Gazebos, 29 Used Cars Killing, 28 James Wood Smoking, 27 Maggot Squirming, 26 Phone Booth Lunches, 25 Cotton Candy Cocoons, 24 Space Vampire Snogging, 23 Bloody Canoes, 22 Pool Corpses, 21 Groovy Ashes, 20 Japanese Giallos, 19 Kung Fu Vampires, 18 Haunted Marches, 17 Eternal Lonelinesses, 16 Curse VHS Tapes, 15 Spectral Snapshots, 14 Mothers Murdering, 13 Prices Bleeding, 12 Models Dying, 11 Betty's Baking, 10 Prices Burning, 9 Seagulls Pecking, 8 Scientists Sneaking, 7 Goldwyn Shooting, 6 Psychic Scamming, 5 Naked Witches, 4 Aliens Spelunking, 3 UFO Abductions, 2 Deputy So-and-Sos, and a Masked Hawk being creepy. Well, hello there, everyone. Happy Halloween. It is the big day. Uh, I know a lot of places did their trick-or-treating uh, on the weekend, on uh, the 29th and the 30th. I know uh, we we took the kids to the 29th and the uh, the 30th. They were doing like some events downtown, and trick-or-treaters came by on the 29th and all that. Um, but this is the day. This is Halloween. For those of us who are horror fans, horror aficionados... Halloweeneries, Halloweeniacs, uh, it, it is, it doesn't matter what day you celebrate this, this today is Halloween. And, uh, I, I think it should be a national holiday. I think everyone should get off of work to sit around and watch scary movies, but, uh, they don't leave me in charge of such things probably for good reason. Um, but it is Halloween. Uh, I want to say, first of all, thank you for joining me on this 31 days of Halloween, uh, for those of you who have listened to the whole thing, even if you just, you know, picking and choosing along the way, that's fine too. Uh, I, I appreciate, uh, the fact that we've been able to kind of celebrate all this together and it's been really fun to hear people respond to the movies and all that. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It has been uh, a blast as always. I already am looking forward to doing it again next year. So I've already been thinking about the list even. So that tells you what kind of broken brain I've got. Anyway, for Halloween and, and to complete our look at Stephen King movies, I'm going back to a TV movie from 1979. And of course, that is the, the Toby Hooper ad adaptation of the Stephen King novel Salem's Lot, uh, which is a, a, a TV movie that... Uh, scared the shit out of an entire generation. Not every piece of it, and we'll talk about that, but uh, it, it's way better than it has any right to be. And I still think, uh, even though there's been another uh, more modern adaptation of Salem's Lot, it's the most successful by far. Um, it gets most of it right. And, and we'll talk about why here in a second, but... Uh, I know there is a planned newer version written and directed by Gary Dobberman, who is the guy who wrote uh, It Chapter One. He wrote The Nun and Annabelle Comes Home and Annabelle and Blood Monkey. Basically, his writing does not suggest that he's got necessarily a deft hand with horror, but I always, uh, you know, will hold out some hope that. You know, it, it, it chapter one is more reflective of his talent than something like Annabelle comes home. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. So, uh, I, I'm excited, uh, to talk about this movie. I saw this movie. I probably saw it not long after it came out. Um, because I was a kid when this would have aired. I don't know that I saw it when it first aired, but they re-ran it. Um, because it was a big production, you know, it's a big two night affair. Uh, if you watch it, which you can do now on shutter, you know, it's still a three hour film. And that's another reason I kind of held on to this one for Halloween, because it's a movie that you can kick back with and just enjoy the Halloweenness of, of the day and watch this three hour epic vampire story, um, which I think is pretty great. So, uh, for, so just to get this out of the way, I love Salem's Lot. I love the book. It, it's maybe my favorite Stephen King novel. Uh, it was the first one I read in that early run of like, 
you know, Carrie and the Shining and Salem's Lot and Dead Zone and Firestarter and Cujo and, you know, up until the mid 80s, uh, where I, and even The Stand, um, where I thought this is the perfect book um, as far as a vampire story goes. And, and to this day, it is the thing that I kind of love the most in terms of vampire stories being told or the way that they're told, which is sort of the genesis of it, right? Like, I, I find it less interesting if it's just a vampire, like the Dracula style of there is a vampire and there's a couple of people being turned into a vampire, but that's kind of it. I really like this plague kind of feeling that, um, you know, as Ben Mir says in uh, in the film, it's a geometric progression. It's vampires making vampires. So two becomes four, becomes eight, becomes 16. And I like that a lot. Uh, I think that's cool. And so that really captured my imagination. And, and also I was a, a budding young writer and the fact that Stephen King likes to use authors as his protagonist, that appealed to me. Uh, it's got kind of a tragic romance at the center of it, um, or doomed romance. And, you know, a young kid that's, uh, again, Stephen King doing Stephen King stuff of having a young boy that is in many ways a, uh, a proxy for his own childlike imagination. And, you know, the, it's clearly it's a monster kid uh, in, in the movie, Mark, uh, both book and movie. And so it, it's a great book. I think it, it's the one whenever someone says, hey, I've never read much Stephen King. What should I read? I always tell them, read Salem's Lot. It's not terribly long. It's well written. And it's it's genuinely scary. There's some really scary stuff. And so when it, it came time to adapt the, the book, it makes sense in a way to do it in this form, to do it as, uh, as kind of a mini series because the, the book and the movie both take their time to use the word vampire. I think in the book it's, you know, after a hundred and something pages, you get the word vampire in the movie. It's almost two hours into this three hour affair that somebody actually uses the word vampire. Um, and, and that's because it is in a uh, modern context, you know, like nobody wants to believe that a vampire is a real thing. And, so they, they don't talk about it in those terms. And, you know, even when somebody finally says, like, hey, there's a vampire afoot, there's a long conversation about, like, you understand what you're saying, right? Like, you are you are no longer going to be taken seriously if you spout this. Like, you, what you need to do is turn this over to the police and let them be the ones to figure out what's what. Um, which is what they try to do, but it doesn't work out because, you know, the police are no better at dealing with something that's supernatural like a manifestation of evil and another thing that you know, the movie and book both do is um, and maybe the the least successful aspect of both book and movie is to uh, more so than the mo movie than the book is to tie all of this to the Marston house and so if you've never read or seen Salem's Lot the brief overview is Ben Mears uh, is a writer who is returning to Salem's Lot. He lived there uh, for a while when he was a kid. While he was there, he had a potentially supernatural encounter in the Marston house or, or saw a ghost or something. And the Marston house is um, a monolith to evil that stands high on a hill in Salem's Lot that looks down over the, the city. And uh, when Ben Mears returns home, he's going to write a book about it. And unfortunately, it has been rented out uh, or purchased outright by two fellows named uh, Straker and Barlow. And uh, so he instead rents a room in the local, uh, you know, bed and breakfast and a boarding house. And so he sets about to write his book. He, he meets a, a young woman named Susan Norton. Uh, and they fall in love. Uh, she's got an ex-boyfriend that's not entirely willing to give up on it. And, you know, that's a little bit of a complication. But what are you going to do? You know, uh, everything's proceeding pretty smoothly. Only it turns out that Kurt Barlow, uh, one of the new owners of the Marston House, um, which is, is known to be a haunted place because of Hubie Marston and the terrible things that happen 
when he built and owned the house. Um, they they buy this house, and and Kurt Barlow uh, is a vampire, and so soon vampires are, you know, loose in Salem's lot. And what the the book and the film do is that they set up a bunch of characters before anything supernatural ever happens. You kind of get this small town vibe. You know, uh, that not everything is on the up and up. It's not entirely this this picturesque kind of uh, the small town affair. You know, there there are people who are having affairs. There are, uh, you know, uh, illicit romances and um, and and crimes, low level crimes being committed. And, you know, the the typical stuff that that kind of uh, David Lynch esque vibe of hey even in a small town there's some really dastardly stuff going on beneath the surface and you know the movie touches on some of this the book of course much more so because there's more room to do it but uh it does uh you know touch upon these ideas particularly there's an affair at the center of it and uh so that i think works pretty well in in the film that you get this setup of, that's fairly normal Um, even though the movie starts with a cold open to let you know, hey, there is some supernatural business afoot. But it's not until, like, the end of the first part that you're getting vampires proper uh, as Barlow's influence and his infection spreads through the town. And the idea, uh, if you're a vampire, is a pretty good one. You take this town that's only a couple of thousand people. It's fairly isolated. By the time anybody knows what's going on, the town is pretty much done. And and that's how it happens, right? I mean, by the time the, you know, Parkins Gillespie, the local constable, gets wind of like, hey, there is something really weird going on in town, it's it's already happened. The, the battle's already lost. And so he beats feet to Florida, or North Carolina, I think is where he says he's going, where he's got some family. And it's left to our intrepid vampire hunters, which is Ben Mears, and there's Burke, the the local teacher. There's, uh, you know, Susan Norton's father, the uh, doctor in town. And that's a little bit different from the book. You know, it's consolidated a little bit and made a little less sprawling. But that all works fine. And and the, and so, you know, then we're off to the races uh, in, in the movie of trying to stop the vampires before they take over the town, trying to stop Barlow before he can uh, succeed in his plan to turn the citizens of Salem's Lot into, you know, vampiric thralls. Um, and uh, so what works and what doesn't work about the about the movie? Um, you know, it's clearly a production from the 1970s, and that is both good and bad. It is good in the sense that You know, it does take its time in building the story. Um, It has some, because Toby Hooper is at the helm, some wonderfully horrific imagery. In fact, uh, I, you know, recently Shudder did that 101 scariest horror movie moments, which uh, I had a really good time with. But um, part of that, you know, list was the vampires coming to the window in Salem's Lot. And it is terrifying. And the one that always gets mentioned is the one with uh, Mark Petrie, the kid, you know, as uh, his old friend comes to the window and does the, let me in, Mark, let me in. He commands it, which is eerie and it's scary, no doubt about that. But the one that gets me on, on watching it again, it's the little kid going to his brother. That, I think, is more terrifying than anything else. Uh, you know, not just because there's this sort of, you know, fraternal corruption and, and that kind of thing, but just the little kid is so frightening and evil. And it, I, I find it really unsettling. But anytime that somebody is showing up at the window scratching, uh, it's really good. There's the Mike Ryerson thing, the, you know, you'll sleep like the dead teacher. That I think is very frightening. And, and well done. Um, I like when you first see Barlow's coffin and all the other vampires are just kind of laying in the dirt around it. You know, like there's the executive vampire and then there's the like shitty other vampires 
that are just low-level grunts in the vampire hierarchy. I, I think that's interesting. I, I think when you get, you know, later on the uh, reveal of the lady vampire, I think that is pretty cool. Uh, I think probably the most effective scene, other than the, the scratching at the window, is the one where Marjorie Glick is coming back to life in the uh, morgue. And Ben is trying to bless the cross that's made of tongue depressors in time to save them. And I think that's really an effective scene. And so, you know, it is, you know, a television miniseries to be sure, but it feels like they got away with some business in this one. Uh, that Toby Hooper push the the boundaries of what is acceptable like it's not gory but it's really scary um those images will kind of burn into your brain they're they're still really effective i think the score is very very good as well and then you also have to uh credit the performances of uh james mason who is wonderful in the movie as as straker you know um, one of my favorite things in movies ever is when he proposes that Barlow and the local, uh, the local preacher face off or the local priest. And he, when the priest holds up a cross, he says back, holy man, back shaman. Um, you know, it's so good. Oh man, it's wonderful. Uh, uh, and I think that's kind of a drop thread in the movie. The the thing with the priest, there's much more about that in the book. And and when they remade the miniseries, that was sort of the framing device. What was the priest? But all that aside, uh, I think all of that works, and and it's why I would recommend it. I mean, there are things that don't work. Um, you know, it, the the acting can be very 70s television. It's a, a little uh, exaggerated, a little hyperbolic at times. But I think it, it's got a mood. It's got an atmosphere. It, it's got enough room in the story to kind of breathe. And you get to see Fred Willard and some satin red boxers. And that's never a bad thing. Um, yeah, there, there are just all these little moments that make... Salem's Lot really eerie to this day to make it really uncomfortable to watch at times. Uh, not because of, you know, the material is is controversial or anything. It's just eerie. And Ho Hooper does an amazing job of creating this overarching sense of dread throughout the film that that things are are bad and are getting worse. And I really, really enjoy it. I mean, I, I wish that it were three nights instead of two so we could get a full like four and a half hours where you could dive into more of the relationships between the people in Salem's lot and, and, you know, see a little bit more of the breakdown of the town. The one thing I will give the remake of this or the, the second mini series that they did, I think it was on TNT, um, is that the final night of Salem's lot, when you see all of the town basically turned into vampires that's pretty fun. I wish that scene existed in this old movie. Um, and, and maybe it would, you know, be the perfect version of Salem's lot. If you could get away with that, but it's still, you know, pretty good. Uh, Rutger Hauer plays Barlow in, uh, in the second mini series, which makes him a little more communicative in this one. It's Reggie Nadler, uh, which you, an actor you may know from such films as, uh, Dracula's dog or Zoltan the Hound of Hell depending on uh, what version you see um, and he's just a Nosferatu like he doesn't really say anything he's just uh, this bald scary blue vampire and I, I think that really works I think the vampire eyes in Salem's Lot are really good too so anyway I've got my minor quibbles with it Watching again, there are certain things I'm like, boy, you know, you can sure tell that this movie is is over 40 years old now. But all that aside, it still works despite itself in, in some cases. Uh, it's still eerie. It's still a fun watch. And again, being on a Monday, being a, a, a Monday Halloween when, you know, you're not going to have trick-or-treaters showing up at the door. Throw this thing on and it's going to rock you right till bedtime. And you get to go to bed thinking about those little kids scraping at the window outside in the mist saying, let me in, Danny, let me in. 
Uh, it, oh, it's chilling. It's so good. All right. That is going to do it uh, for this here 31 Days of Halloween. Uh, we have done 31 movies. I've had a blast. Thank you, thank you, thank you again uh, for joining me. If you are listening to this on the Dark Parade uh, podcast feed, then I uh, implore you to check out Legion Podcasts uh, on the podcast catcher of your choice, where you can find other shows that I do and a bunch of other shows that are terrific. Um, be sure, uh, if you were listening on the Legion Podcast feed, uh, you hop over and join us on the Dark Parade feed, where we will be getting back to regular business this very week uh, and and get into some, uh, some shenanigans. Uh, with uh, the regular Dark Parade schedule, including uh, some found footage fool and some Heart of Horror and a regular episode and all kinds of fun stuff. And I also would entreat you to remain spooky out there, even though it is no longer Halloween. We've only got 11 months to go before it's October again. And uh, remember, you know, you, you are an ambassador of horror. If you are listening to this, you are, you are a horror fan. Uh, so go out there. Uh, be your best spooky self. And, uh, and if you don't join us on the dark parade, and if you're not hanging around Legion podcast after this 31 days is over, then be sure you come back next year when we do another 31 days of Halloween all over again, the 2023 version, which hardly sounds like a year. All right, guys, that's it. Have the happiest of Halloweens and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>